food for thought. Uh, number two, just random thoughts that I was having this week that I write them down so you can pass them. I don't, get, I don't give them to you beforehand because you'll, you'll read them. Glory to God. <laughs> and I want you to pay attention to the word today. Well, let's, let's hold on our offering until after, uh, after the message. It's, um, it's come to the top of the hour here. And uh, people will be joining us on Facebook. If you're joining us live, welcome. We're, we're glad you're choosing to spend this time. Uh, whether you're way out there in Colorado, hi guys, good to see you. Uh, whether you're in India, you know, uh, tuning in, uh, wherever you are, we know that we have people who are joining us. Uh, the message is posted on Facebook afterwards so you can see it then. We also broadcast uh, things on um, on YouTube, they're out on YouTube, and uh, we'll be doing Roku and all those other things as we go on. You know, there's, there are messages, I was going to say, there are messages that excite me. Every message excites me. Uh, I, 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 really, I really don't know that, that I've ever entered into the pulpit unexcited about the message. <laughs> and I mean personally excited. Not, and, and part of my personal excitement is, if you get it, you're going to get excited like I am. You know, there's, there's a thing in life about when, when you really like something, you'll travel for it, you'll get it, and you'll talk about it. When Donna and I and the family were living in Hubbardston, and um, we were uh, part of Pastor Jonathan's uh, church uh, down in the Boston area at the time, uh, for those of you who don't know, that's about an hour journey to go to church. We'd leave, and we'd go down there, and uh, we worked. They had two services. We worked in the nursery for one service, and then we went to the second service, um, people would say, well, isn't there, isn't there a church closer than that? And my explanation always was, you know, if, if you find a really, really good restaurant, how far are you willing to drive to eat really, really good food? And when you find where the Word of God is coming forth with, with power and clarity and is just opening up your life, how far are you willing to drive to receive it? And see, we're, we're of the kind that we're, we're willing to make those trips. We're willing to, to do those things. Uh, but what surprises me is that not everybody gets excited. And, and, and I, I've come to realize that then obviously you're not seeing what I see. You know, if, if, uh, if I recommend a restaurant because the food's really good and you don't like it, well, you've got different tastes than I do. Or maybe you have no taste buds at all. You know, uh, but uh, when, it, when it comes to the Word of God, uh, it, it's amazing that you can be among a group of people who you would think would be all on the same page, but maybe they're not. Maybe they're not, not into it like you are. And, and I think of a, of a couple of stories that came across my, my path this week. Uh, and one was uh, Keith and, and was sharing about he and Phyllis, and... Um, you know, he said they were young, they got married young, he never defined what young was. They were living in a second-hand mobile home with second-hand furniture. And uh, she was working as a receptionist in a doctor's office. And the doctor kept saying to her, I've got some tapes you should listen to, cassette tapes. And they're preaching cassette tapes. And, and every week this doctor would say to her, Phyllis, you know, take some of these tapes home. And she said, no, 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 that's okay, we're fine. Well, he kept saying this every week. You know, here, here's a set of tapes. You, you, need, to, to, you need to hear these. They're, they're by, a, 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 you know, a Kenneth Copeland and by a, a Jerry Seville and, you know, by a Kenneth Hagen and, and by, a, you know, a John Osteen and, and by a Frederick K.C. Price. And, 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 you know, Phyllis just put him off, but after a while, he is her boss. And so one day they just, she said, okay, okay, fine, I'll, I'll take them home over the weekend. And so um, Keith and Phyllis sat down on their, you know, imitation leather couch, that's plastic, <laughs> with their little cassette player, which, by the way, was really new technology then. And, and they put in this tape, and it absolutely just startled them. Uh, they, they finished the first one, and they put in the second one. And by the time they heard those tapes, they had never heard this in their life. Did they believe the Bible? Yes. Did they believe in God? Yes. But they never heard the Word of God preached with integrity, that it says what it means, and it means what it says. And if it says you can have it, you can have it. 
Don't let anyone tell you, well, you can't, or the days of miracles have passed. Or, you know, and, and they got so excited, they went back, and every week they'd take more tapes from this doctor home. And uh, Keith says, you know, that we were so excited, I, I asked if we could pass it on, and we took a tape that really excited them, and they made copies of it and started to give it to some of their friends. And they were so excited. I mean, this was like something they've never heard in their life. And so they go to their friends the next week and say, well, well, what did you think of it? And their friend said, well, I, I haven't gotten around to listen to it yet. It's like, what do you mean you haven't gotten around to listen to it? And they said, well, you know, a tape of a preacher? I mean, you know, no churches we go to make tapes. Nobody did in those days. And, and why would anybody want to hear a sermon twice anyway? It was, you know, you had to... Uh, and he said, no, 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 you've got to listen to it. You've got to listen to it. And then they'd go back the next week, and, and their friend, friends would say, things, well, yeah, I listened to part of it, and, and it, it's just enough for me. And, and, and he talks about the fact that they came from that place of, you know, the word is new to them, and they're excited. They started devouring the word of God. They ended up uh, going out to camp meeting while they're out at camp meeting in Tulsa, uh, the Holy Spirit speaks to them, tells them, I want you to go to Tulsa to, to Rhema Bible School. And so the two of them, you know, pack up and leave their jobs and then miracle stories about that. But they end up going to Tulsa for what they thought was going to be one year. Uh, they had extended by then the program to a two-year program. They stayed for those two years. And then they started working in the ministry. And 20 years later, they left Tulsa. And if you know Brother Keith Moore now, he's pastoring two churches, one in, in, in Branson and, and one in Sarasota. And uh, he is the instigator of sending out the word free all over the world. Any message he has, any CD, any, any, you can download them free. They'll even send you hard copies free. Why? Because there's those of us who keep sending the money to do that. You know, you don't need to charge $5 for a tape. Give it away free. Because it, it's got to go out. And, and when he was sharing that, you know, the, his, his point was that other people had equal opportunity for the same tape to turn them on, but it didn't. The same message came forth that drastically altered their life. I look at their life now. And, you know, poor, broke, you know, young people who now are prospering and serving God around the world and doing great things for people. Who would expect? They didn't go to college. They didn't go the route of success in the world. They went the route of God. And anybody could do that. Anybody in their town could have done that. Any of their friends could have done that. But they chose to do it, and others said, no, no, that's not me. So as I'm thinking and listening to his testimony this week, I got thinking about that doctor. He doesn't tell us who the doctor is. You know... That doctor, I don't know, maybe he was an older man, maybe he's going home to be with the Lord right now, I, I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that in part of the, the big scheme of things anybody knows, but, but I know something. That doctor's greatest contribution was not his medical practice, it was that working in his medical practice was a receptionist that he finally persuaded to take a tape. And giving that one tape to that girl changed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people around the world, continuing to say, you need to listen, you need to listen. I might not be a preacher, I'm a doctor, I'm not a this or that, but I can keep saying, you need to hear this, you need to hear this, you need to hear this, to the point where maybe I'm sure the devil said, you're bugging her. But you know, all he knew was there's life in that, and he gave it, and he kept pushing and pushing, and literally the impact in that one couple's life has changed hundreds of thousands of people around the world. And then as I was thinking about that, Holy Spirit reminded me that when I was uh, doing uh, some Bible studies up in this area, I'd been pastoring a church, I was in between churches and I was doing some Bible studies, and um, Jack Stonefield from uh, Townsend, Jack and Jane, and, and Jack and Jane uh, were rather what I would call simple country folk. He, uh, Jack, I don't, he worked in it someplace, but he was a, 
a gentleman farmer is what he wanted to be. He, he had a farm and kind of enjoyed that. And they were really back to nature kinds of people. And, and uh, you know, and here I am, you know, I'm, I've, I've been to, grew up in the army and I consider myself kind of a middle class person, went to college, went to seminary, you know, I'm an ordained pastor, you know, all, all whatever that means. And Jack one time comes up to me and he says, Don, he says, I think you're ready for this. And it's like, ready for what? And he hands me a set of six tapes from Kenneth Copeland called Six Steps to Excellence in Ministry. I said, well, thank you. I was not a cassette tape listener. You, you got to understand in those days, listening to cassettes, people didn't do those things. Not even, cars didn't even have ways, and CDs weren't even thought of. That was off the chart. I know that's prehistory, horse and buggy to some of you. But Jack gave me that, that set, and as I said, I was, I was between churches at the time, and so uh, I had uh, sold my house and was living in a camping trailer for the summer to wait to see where God wants us to go. I, I had no doubt that God was, had a place to go. I, I never waited till I had it till I left. If he said, leave here and go to a place I'll show you, that sounded rather biblical. So, so I did that. So I'm, I'm, you know, camping with all kinds of kids hanging out of the camp, camper, you know. And, and I, I remember sitting in that campground just over the border in New Hampshire. And I put in the first of those tapes. And, and I'd never heard of Brother Copeland, never heard of Word of Faith, never, I never heard of any of that. Come on, I went to seminary. You know, I never heard that stuff. And I put in his first tape, and, and he had a really Texas drawl on those voice days. And, and I started listening, and I'm about, oh, maybe 20 minutes into it, and that's it. I, I, I can't take any more. I mean, his preaching is not congregational preaching. It's, it's not Presbyterian preaching, you know, and, it's, and uh, so, so I turned it off. And I said, well, yeah, that, that's just not for me. And, and then Holy Spirit planted this thought. So are you going to tell Jack, you weren't even man enough to listen to the tapes? So I said, no, I can't do that. So I put the tape back in, restarted it. Except now what I did is when, when that preacher said some things I'd never heard in my life, I mean, I'd never heard these things. You know, God wants you to prosper. Where are you coming from? That must be some kind of weird stuff. But when he said it, he quoted a verse, so I stopped the tape recorder. And I got my Bible out and looked up the verse, and I'm thinking, my goodness, it says it. It's right there. And then I'd turn on, he'd, he'd come to the next verse, and he'd say that, and I'd stop the tape recorder. I spent over three hours listening to that one tape over and over and over and over, and I thought, my goodness, it's all in my Bible. He's not saying anything that the Bible doesn't say. And so I listened to the rest of the tapes. By the time I got finished with that, that set of tapes, I was hooked for life. I, I was hooked. I mean, I was fed something. I believed the Bible. No, I didn't. I believed what people told me the Bible said. I believed what my seminary professors told me it said. I didn't believe things because apparently they didn't believe them. I went to a, 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 a seminary that whose founder, A.J. Gordon, was a great believer in divine healing. But in my days going there, nobody believed in divine healing. If it be your will, God, prayers were what, what was going on around. And it's, it's like the very book that had turned me on at the age of 16 that I got so excited about, but I sat under preachers who couldn't take me where they were, were not. I sat under traditional Christianity. And, and the Bible, which was alive to me at a personal level, but, but I didn't know how to understand most of it. If you had told me you don't understand it, Pastor, I said, what do you mean I don't understand it? I have a college education. I have a seminary degree. And this little hick preacher is opening things in this word. And, 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 and to make a long story short, shortly after there, God said, okay, you're ready. And he, he opened a, a ministry for me. Uh, that was totally outside the denomination, a brand new church that was starting uh, with a businessman who was bringing people to the Lord, and he wanted the people in the business world to prosper, but they were going to churches that would tell him, God doesn't want you to make money. So he started his own church. And, and when he called, I, and said, I want, you know, you were recommended to me, I want to talk to you. 
And I said, I'm, again, it was a, I'm not interested in that. I'm looking for the next denominational church I go to. Holy Spirit said, you better check out and see if that's me. Amen. And so I, I started preaching in that church. And the first week I was there, I sat down with he and his wife one night, right up here on Blossom Street in Fitchburg. And he said, so what do you think about Kenneth Hagin? I said, I've never heard of Kenneth Hagin. His wife goes over to a little library they have. She picks out of it every single book Kenneth Hagin wrote. I mean, there had to be 28, 25 of them. Books, pamphlets, everything he wrote, brand new. She had, they had a lending library there. She gave me a whole stack. You know, this is twice that I've had people who don't have the credentials I have giving me things because I need them. You know, first Jack gives me those tapes, and now they give me a whole stack of Kenneth Hagin books. And I start reading the books, and I think, oh, my goodness, you know, uh, you know he, 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 uh, he's writing things that Kenneth Copeland preaches. And then I read, no, Kenneth is preaching things that he wrote. All this is happening within a period of four months. And it culminated with me being at a camp meeting in Tulsa when all kinds of wild things were going on and people were being healed right in front of my eyes, 5,000 people. We didn't worship like that as Congregationalists. We didn't lay hands on people and see them fall over under the power of God. You know, we didn't see tongues and prophecy. I mean, quite amazing. Uh, is this okay? I'm going somewhere with this. I, I want you to understand this. I, I might have told you the story about I, I'm there, and, and at one point, um, Patsy Harrison gets up. Uh, she is uh, Kenneth Hagin's daughter. And she walks up on the stage, the auditorium, like I say, 5,000 people. And she goes up on the stage, and she just walks up there. I mean, I didn't know if it was part of the program or what. And, and she gets up there, and all of a sudden, she just starts speaking in what I thought, I don't know, is it Spanish? I don't speak Spanish. This, and, 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 and she's obviously not just talking like I am. She's speaking with power and authority, and she's up there, and she's animated, and suddenly she grabs a potted plant there. And she's still speaking, and I realize, oh, that must be tongues. Shows you how, you know, God will use you whether you know things. And she starts waving this back and forth. And then all of a sudden, you know, after she's waving this, she goes, ah, and bam. I mean, right over, I mean, falls backwards, straight backwards. No catcher, no nothing, just straight forward, and she's laying there. And my eyes pop open. I mean, I'm like, I mean, I got chills running up and down me. And Buddy Harrison, her husband, gets up from the front pew. And he just walks up on the, on the platform just so casually. I'm thinking his wife's like dead on the, on the thing, and he just walks up there casually. You know, nobody's reacting like she's dead, so I guess she's not, but she's not moving. You know, and, and uh, he goes up there just, just like this, just walks up. Thus saith the Lord, and he starts speaking. And I'm realizing, my lightning-fast seminary-educated brain put it together. Tongues and interpretation. So you can go to a school that says it, it isn't true, but when you see it, that's what that, what this is that. And he's going along, and all of a sudden he says, and the Spirit will move through your congregations like the wind moving through a tree. And he reaches and grabs that same plant. And it will shake the very foundations of what you thought church was till the power of God overcomes you. Bam! And he's laying back on the right next to her. And I'm thinking, they could not have rehearsed that. This is not, let's put on a show. I am watching a demonstration of the power of God. By then, it feels like every hair on my arm and every hair on my head is standing up. I mean, even as I start to tell this again, it's like my hairs remember that. And, you know? And I heard a voice. I don't mean with these natural ears. I'm, I'm in the, if this is an auditorium, there's balconies all around. I'm right up there. Here's the stage. I'm right up there looking right at the, I got a front row seat. And I'm, by that time, I'm on the edge like this. I'm not looking to my left or my right. I am glued. And I heard a voice. Are you in or are you out? That's all. Are you in or are you out? And, 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 and again, I thought, if I'm out, get up and leave. 
this is nothing for you, you don't want to have any part of it. If you're in, you're in. And I can remember saying, I'm in. I'm in. And I've never gotten out. Hmm? All because Jack Stonefield gave me a tape and said, I think you're ready to hear this. Now, all of that to say, what are you doing to get the word going? We have free CDs every week. Every week. Uh, you know, if we run out, we'll pr we can do more. We don't charge anybody for them. That's part of our ministry. It's in our budget to do that. And, you know, we print, I don't know, what do we do, 30 or 40? Or, and, and uh, you know, if, if you want to... You want five? I don't want you taking them and they sit on your dashboard because someday you might remember. Take one and give it away. And if you succeed in giving away one, the next week take two and see if you can get rid of two. Take five and get rid of all five and say, I'm ready for ten. But how can you dare judge the other people who may or may not be ready for it? How can you make that decision for them? Well, they're my neighbor, but I don't think they'd be interested. How, how dare you and I judge other people as to whether they're ready? Say, hey, I heard this, and it turned me on. I know a rest in it was really great. You know, if they go and don't like it, fine, nothing lost. But if it's easy to say, I went to a new restaurant and this was great, how easy should it be to say, listen, I got a CD here for you. It's, it's a really great message. I think you would get a lot out of it. You can do that with strangers. You can do that with, with all kinds of people. We have a, a man up, up the street here who comes down every, every few months just to get CDs. You know, and he listens to them. All right? So, so I, I want to put that in your thinking because if the word's exciting, pass it on. I was just wondering how I got into all that. It's because I said that when I get in the pulpit, I'm excited about the word. Now, I'm excited about the word for today. I am. I'm personally excited about it. it it's, I, I'm ex, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm having fun with God. I'm getting up in the middle of the night. If, if the devil wakes you up, you know, spit in his eye. And if, if, if I can't sleep or my sleep is disturbed, I'm getting up and, and I'm just getting in the Word and writing things out. And I got more no notes in the last, I want to say, four months than I probably have in the last four years. Just, just revelation going. Uh, that is, I'm excited about this message today. And, and it's a message uh, that, uh, you know, when I tell you the passage, you're going to say, oh, well, we all know this story, because it's about the prodigal son. <laughs> oh, yes, it's going to be easy. I can sit back, and, and this is going to be a good one. No, you don't, because if you can sit back, and you don't get excited by the end, you haven't heard it. And, and, and so I'm excited for me because I've been poking at this for a week now. I was excited last week about the message. He gave it to me a week ago, over a week ago. I wanted to preach it last week, but I had something else that, that was on the agenda. Remember, I'm a messenger. I don't get to decide. <laughs> it's what the king tells me, messenger boy, this is what you need to bring. And, and um, so I'm, I'm excited personally. I really am. I'm, uh, I don't know if I look excited or not, but I am excited. For me, personally, you can all go to sleep, I'm going to preach it. Okay? I'm going to preach it because I want to hear it. I want to hear what Holy Spirit has to reveal to Don Long. Amen? So Don Long's going to bring this message because Don Long expects to hear today more out of the message than I, I know is there. But I'm also excited for you. And, and, and if I knew how to do it, I would come and slap you across the face if that would it. To, to wake you up and say, get excited, get ready, uh, because I know uh, that what that message is doing in me can do it in you. It, the message that is here that is working in me some, some exciting things isn't because I'm a pastor. It's because I'm a child of God. And I have a heavenly father who loves me and wants the best in my life. Well, he, he's your heavenly father. He wants the best in your life. So the food that is about to be fed is exciting. Turn to somebody and say, I'm already excited. 
<laughs> Glory to God. You, you know, in the, in the business world, in the uh, in this world of psychology, there's a problem-solving technique called synectics. In fact, there's a company called synectics. Synectics is a problem-solving methodology that stimulates thought processes of, what, of which the subject is unaware. In other words, I can bring out creativity in you. You don't know you have. It's built into you. Guess who built it in? Abba did. And Synectics uh, was founded by two men. Uh, William J.J. Gordon was one of them. And, and he emphasized the importance of what he called, listen, quote, a metaphorical process to make the strange become familiar. A metaphorical, you know what a metaphor is? You're, you're, you're t it's an analogy. Well, let, let me make it very easy. It's a parable. Yeshua wasn't really talking about fish. He, he wasn't really talking about lost coins. He, he, he come on, are, are you with me? He wasn't really talking about nets. <laughs> come on. He, he, he was trying to take you from things you're familiar with into things that you don't, aren't aware, because when you come at religion thinking religiously, you miss it. When, when you try to get hold of a concept of who God is, by coming through the door of religion, you're going to get messed up. Why? Because your brain is filled with religious ideas about God. And if, in fact, your ideas are wrong, you, you, we can't shake it out of you because your mind's locked in on it. it. You know, they say practice makes perfect. Practice does not make perfect. Practice makes permanent. So if you practice something wrong, you'll be very good at doing it wrong. Without even thinking, you'll do it wrong. Because you learned it wrong. Theology is no different. If you learn things about God that are wrong, and you learn them, in, in other words, a person off the street may have heard something about God that's wrong, but he's never gone to church and, 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 and I can change that quicker than someone who's gone to church year after year after year for 20, 30 years and heard the same thing over and over and over again. You know, it, it's now locked in. And so how do we get you uh, into something you don't know when there's an internal resistance to it? There's a blockage to it. And in the world of business, this was a process where you apply what you know about something that appears totally unrelated to your challenge, and you can then all of a sudden find answers. Let me give you a, a, just a quick idea, because I can't get into it. We'll, we'll be here forever, although it's, it is exciting. Uh, I use this with a, a, a group of, uh, uh, of pastors trying to address issues within their churches. And I said, okay, I'm, I'm at a, a blackboard in for those of you who don't know, that's before whiteboards, and uh, you use something called chalk. And, and I'm, I'm at a blackboard, and I'm, uh, I said, okay, what, it, what are the problems that, that face you as pastors? And then we isolated it down to, to one key problem. This is what we're trying to address. At that point, we're, we can't move forward. Because they all have ideas, because they've been pastors of what will work and won't work. Well, let's do this. No, I tried it. It didn't work. Let's do this. Let's do that. I said, so I'm going to take you on a, a journey uh, uh, with synectics, and, and you're going to have to trust me on this. So let's put this aside. I, I don't want to talk about church. I know that's why you're here. Uh, I pick, pick a, just give me a, an image of a situation that seems like, you know, it's stuck, it's not moving forward, or it's the, the, the conclusion's already obvious. So they came up with the best uh, uh, list, and we narrowed it down to one. I remember what that one was. Uh, a little old lady in a, in, a, in a nursing home in a rocking chair. In other words, her, her life is ending. You, you, you can't say, how do we make it better? You know. So we, I, I wrote up there, little old lady in a rocking chair. I said, okay, bear with me. I said, we're only going to take 20 minutes with it. Uh, what, what could you do to help the little old lady? And so we started, they just started making all these crazy suggestions. And after about 20 minutes, we'd kind of exhausted, because what were their minds doing? Their minds were focused on this problem over here, 
called the little old lady. And, and, and their mind is spitting out all these ideas of what we could do. And then I went over and I put a piece of paper over the little old lady, but I kept all the ideas there. I said, do any of those ideas have any possibility of helping you with this problem over here called the church? And at first people looked at me, what are you talking about? And then suddenly, well, I've used that in the business world, where we're trying to solve a marketing issue, and we ended up saying, well, let's talk about, one time we talked, let's talk about race cars. And so we got talking about race cars, and how to improve race cars, and how to, you know, what could you do to make the race car more efficient, and everything like that. Same thing. After 20 minutes, I just, okay, forget the race cars. In this list of things we can do to improve the race car, is there anything we can do to improve our marketing campaign? And what it tapped into this, your brain is amazingly creative. But you have put blocks in its way. I've already tried this marketing plan. I've already done this. I know what works. I know what doesn't work. And you have limited your brain's creativity. But if I can free that up by letting your brain just talk about something else, that creativity that was trying to get out about your issue in marketing suddenly came out over because you're having this free, non-pressure conversation about sports cars, and the next thing you know, you got answers. Now, all of that was to explain that these guys understand what Yeshua was doing. The reason Yeshua used parables is because if he comes at trying to teach you, God loves you. I want you to understand God loves you. That is not a new idea if you're, if you're religious. God loves you. But there's a lot of buts and ands and ifs stacked around it that get in the way. And so Yeshua uses parables. Which of you as a father, if your son asks for, uh, for a meal, would give him a snake? And if you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more does your heavenly father desire to give good things to you? See, that parable, when I saw it, opened up that Abba never would send evil things. I, would not, I remember when, Scott was probably three years old when I got hold of that. I would never, never, ever, ever put cancer on him or push him down a flight of stairs to teach him something. That's ludicrous. But I lived in a church that when people got cancer, they said, God put it on you to teach you. If somebody had an accident, God brought it in your life to teach you. But Yeshua said, so if I come and say, God doesn't do that, you're locked into God does that, because that's what you're taught. But if all of a sudden I take you away from God, let's talk about parents. A good parent wouldn't do that. You will say, of course not. We'd report them to DCF for child abuse. Then if we would do that with an earthly parent, why wouldn't we do that with a God who is doing that to people, if that's what you believe? Now, why did Yeshua do that? Because way back then, 2,000 years ago, he realized that religion has the effect of destroying faith and overcoming truth. By your traditions, Yeshua said to the Pharisees, you've made the word of God null and void. You've made it as if it's not... Oh, you say you love the Torah, you say you follow the Torah, but your traditions have overridden the Torah. So in, in Judaism, there is a teaching that what the rabbis say trumps what the Torah says. So when you go to a rabbi about one of their traditions, say, but here's what Torah believes, but the rabbis believe and teach that they have authority to interpret the Torah the way they want to. That is exactly the same teaching in Roman Catholicism. That it doesn't matter what the scripture says, the Pope and the hierarchy have the right to interpret what's right. And if you read through history, that is their justification for why you should worship on Sunday and not Sabbath. And they don't hide it. The Pope had the right to make that change. And they rightly acknowledge where the change came from. It didn't come from the Bible. It came from uh, the decision of the church. And they will admit, that's not what Scripture teaches. You read the theologians in the Catholic Church and they'll tell you, the scripture teaches 
Sabbath. But the church decided we're going to make it Sunday. That, they're, they're not trying to hide that. Okay? What happens? Tradition overrode. Well, if that tradition overrides, then what about the tradition that God, you know, is not in favor of your success? That God, God is watching over you to, you know, to beat you on the head. He's making a list and checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty and nice. Oh, no, that's the guy in the red suit. Or is it? See, how many of us have an image of a heavenly father who's roaming the world to and fro, looking for people through whom he can demonstrate himself strong? How many of us have an image instead that we have a heavenly father who hovers around like the spy in the sky? checking our every movement, and keeping a list of things he's going to address with us at the end of the day if he, if he can, but if not, in that final judgment, there's that list. Yet all along, the Bible says that love does not keep a record of rights and wrongs. That's what the Bible says, but traditional religious thinking gets in the way. So Yeshua used parables to get us out of that. Wow, that was a long introduction. Parables, how to understand the kingdom of God. Most of his parables were about the kingdom of God. How it works, how to live in it. Why? Because he can't come at it straight, because if he comes at it, you've got prejudged ideas. Religion can lock you into thought patterns which preclude discovering the truths of the kingdom. You've always thought it was one way, and then you discover you really had an incomplete, inadequate or even wrong idea, you had the wrong image in your mind. Yeshua taught in parables so he could lead you from the known to the unknown. And so when we come to Luke uh, chapter 15, turn there with me. Luke chapter 15, we come to the parable that most people know as the parable of the uh, prodigal son. Now, in, in my particular translation of the Bible here, version of the NIV, it calls it the parable of the lost son. That, that's more in keeping with the chapter because the first parable is about lost sheep and the second one is about a lost coin and then the third one is about a lost son. When you think of a title of the prodigal son, you think of the son who selfishly took his money and, and went off to do his own thing. But when you think it's a lost son, it's a different attitude. If if, if my son is lost, I need to find out how I can find him. Come on. A lost coin, I need to find it. Uh, The lost sheep, I go looking for it. I'm not concerned about those who are right. Well, the lost son is somebody that there is a concern for. A different picture of Yahweh from the Yahweh standing in heaven saying, yeah, that's my wayward son, the black sheep in the family who walked away. To that's my lost son, and I'm always standing at the end of the road waiting for him to come. Let, let's read it to get, a, get into mind. Uh, verse, verse 11 in chapter 15, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, say spent everything. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, say came to his senses. Great message, I've preached many of them. That's not where we're going today. (laughs) When he came to his senses, just just come to your senses. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father. Say, back to my father. And I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. So he got up and went to his father. It's not can you come to your senses. It's can you get up and change. Are you willing to get up and head in the right direction? 
It's not sitting there, oh, well, woe is me, I'm a sinner, I'm blah, 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 and have a pity party. No, he said, I'm going to do something about it. So he got up. That's not the message either. But while he was still a long way off, say still a long way off. Come on, come on, come on. Well, you know, when you get everything right with God, then he'll consider you. No, 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 no. You're still a long way off, but you're headed in a direction. Ah, come on. Ten lepers say, Yeshua, have mercy on us. What do you want? We want to be healed. He says, go to the priests and show yourself. As they went, they were healed. The action of God. They didn't have to get to the priests to be healed. But by the way, they weren't healed at that moment. It's in the process of doing what they were told. In the process, they were healed. While he was yet a long way off, he's walking, but he's still got a long way to go to regain his intimacy with his father. In fact, he's not even looking for intimacy with his father. He's looking simply with, I, I'd, I'd rather be a servant in dad's house. Come on. Are, are, are we here? Come on, that's not the message either. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, to his arms around him, and kissed him. God is always the initiator when you make a step. He does not stand there with folded arms saying, when you get it all right, when everything's repaired, when it's all there, then come and talk to me and I'll say, well, I've been watching you and for seven months you've been doing all these things to earn my favor and okay, finally, I'll bless you. I've watched your tithing, you were inconsistent, now you're consistent, and you're consistent long enough that now I will bless you. No, while you're yet a long way off, you don't even have the right vision, you're still visioning I'm going to come back as a servant. He, he's filled with compassion. Why? This is not about the sinner. This is about a family member. Come on. Oh, man. Uh, hot off the press. When do you become a family member? When you give your life to Christ and say a prayer, invite him into your life. No. Because God wrote your name in the Lamb's book of life before the foundation of the world. He already has treated you like a family member before you repent. I should have died as a baby from some sickness that I had. I wasn't a Christian then. I didn't give my life to the Lord. My parents didn't have faith to pray. Why was God working in my life then? Because he treated me as a son before I came to the time in this dimension where I said, I make you my Lord. He lives in a different dimension. In his dimension, if you're born again, in his dimension, you've always been born again. So he's always treated you like his son or his daughter, even in the midst of the darkest of sin, if in fact you are his. Oh, glory to God. That's not the message either. We, we could preach on a lot of this. The son said to him, verse 21, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Now, what is what, what has he got? Not that that's wrong, that's a right place to come to, but he's stuck at that place. All, he, he, he needs to repent, and he needs to call it sin, but he's stuck at the point of, I'm a sinner. I've offended. He's stuck there. Many people come to God, and, and they, re, they repent, and, 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 and pray and sincerely repent and get up, but the next day their self-image is, I'm the man that did that, I'm the woman that did that, I'm just a sinner. They're stuck at that point, and that's what religion does. It keeps you stuck at the point of failure. Mm. That's close to the message. Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But, 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 verse 22, but, but changes everything that's going on. But, but is, is about to break in and change the whole dynamic 
that's in this young man's mind. The whole image inside of him is about to be drastically changed. And I pray that today something happens that drastically change, changes what's going on in your mind, in your soul. I'm not speaking to your spirit man. I'm speaking so you'll understand who your spirit man is. Your mind, your emotions have got to have a radical breakthrough that radically changes what's going on. What's going on is, I've sinned. Yes, you have. I squandered the money. Yes, you did. You abused your father. Yes, you did. You know, uh, I need to repent. Yes, you do need to repent. But that is, I am willing to be simply a servant. I'm nothing. I have nothing. I'm of little value. Just to let me sit in the corner. That's why I get upset when I hear preachers say, let's all say together, we're just sinners. No, I was a sinner. The Bible nowhere, nowhere calls a born-again child a sinner. I didn't say you don't sin. The Bible doesn't say you don't sin. But sin is no longer your nature. And when you sin, you have listened to the one that used to control you, and you need to kick him out and say, you're not my Lord anymore. You have no legal right to bring that to me. You have no legal right to be tempting me like that. I rebuke you, and I think what God says I'm going to think. We're, 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 we're almost at the message. You understand why I'm excited? Come on, come on, come on. Uh uh, this is appetizer. But the father said, he said, but the father said. He said, but the father said. And you're going to have to spend the rest of your life as a believer deciding who gets the right word, what you say or what the father says. I don't ask my body if it's healed, I ask the word of God if I'm healed. I don't ask my checkbook if I prosper. I ask the word of God if I prosper. And you're making that choice every day. And every time you use your mouth to say, I can't pay a bill, I can't do this, I don't have money for this, you have sided with the checkbook. The checkbook says, trumps what God says. In your mind. And it's not the truth but if you continue to speak that, it becomes your truth. Let me say that again. It's not the truth, but it becomes your truth because you keep speaking that. A big argument could have ensued with the son and the father. But the father says, but the son says, no, no, I really. And the father says, well, yeah, but no. You know, and, and you can see this man arguing with his father. So well, why would he do that? We're about to get into the message, which is good news. And yet that's what's going on in the life of the vast majority of Christians. We, we know how to repent. If you brought up Catholic, you know how to make a good confession. And if you've been brought up Protestant, you know how to really feel guilty. And sometimes when we're coming to God in that kind of prayer, I think God wants to say, But I say! But while he was, but the father said to him, verse 22, the father said to his servants, quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Bring a ring on his, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fatted calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found so they began to celebrate. Mm. Now that's all exciting. But Holy Spirit said, I want you to look and see what he was given. Quick, bring the best robe. Now wait a minute. Quick? Notice who he's addressing. He's not addressing the son. Go, go in the closet. Pick out the best robe. He addresses the servants. In the kingdom of God, who are the servants? Angels. The angels are, are designed to what? Serve the needs of the, of the sons and daughters of God. They're your servants. They're the servants of the kingdom. There you are coming to your father. The father is greeting you. He's, he's excited to see you back. 
and you start with your, I've sinned, I've done this, I've done this, I'm, I'm really not worthy, and you're going through the mantra, and, and, and he, he doesn't address you. He says, Turn, get, see, see Abba turning to the angel and say, quick, make haste, go find the best robe in the closet and put it on him. I'm going to make an outside the scripture assumption that the young man did take a bath before that happened. I don't think there was a supernatural bathing taking place, though it, it could have been. Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Now, now get the picture. You're there. You're, you're, you're feeling totally unworthy. You're, you're hoping you can appeal to my sonship. Uh, you're hoping that you can appeal that you really are a daughter because the, you know, the word could be, you're no son of mine, you're no daughter of mine, be gone. You know, that, that would be, ah, now you're really blown away. You know? So you're hoping there's some compassion that you can pull on your father for. And, and it's not like, well, go find some clothes in the, use, in the clothing closet. But he tells the servant, go, go find the best robe. Now, if you're the servant, what are you going to look? You're going to look for a second-hand robe? No, you're going to go find the best. I'm going to look in, in the closet, find the best of robes. One size fits all. And put it on him. Put it on him. You, you don't have to put a thing on. Come on. The servant is going to come and put the robe on you. Like I say, my assumption is there's a mikvah there. Okay, come on, son. In, in the servant's going to help you get in the mikvah to get you all scrubbed up. Come on, outside, and they're going to take your old robe, discard it, and they're going to say, "Throw you. Here's your new robe. Put it on." They're going to put it on you. At the moment when you feel the most worthless, the father says. I'm going to treat you like royalty. Nobody puts my suit on me. I don't live in a world where I have people coming around, Pastor, let me help you put your suit on. Can I fix your suit? Well, Donna does put my suspenders for me. <laughs> you know, but, but, but it's like I don't, I don't live in a Buckingham Palace, I, you know, where I come out and everything's laid out. and they, No, that's, I've had that experience, however, of somebody buying me a suit, two suits, in fact, and, and, and I got seven to choose from, but I'm going to get to have two, and, and it was already pre-planned, and, and this guy did all this. It was like he was putting clothes on his pastor, though he wasn't physically doing that. Mentally, he did that by going ahead and picking out suits for me. Now watch this. And then put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Now, best robe is honor. The best robe means honor. You go into, uh, even in the world, you don't want to be more elegantly dressed than the host. You, you go to a wedding, this was, I don't know what, I don't think there's any of these traditions left, but the, the traditions used to be, you don't want to outdress the bride's mother. You know, you don't want to show up it's the, it, the, it's the bride's day and then the bride's mother. And I've, I've had the groom's mother ask me if I know what the bride's mother is wearing because they don't want to outdress the bride's mother because this is the bride's day. It's about her. Now, that's just etiquette. Like I said, it may have gone away. But, but when, you, when you go into the king's palace and, and the king is going to be there, you don't want to outclass the king. If you're going to be knighted by Queen Elizabeth, and they do this, and you're going to receive knighthood, and they're going to teach you what you do, and how you curtsy properly, and how you, you kneel on the kneeler, and she's going to take the sword, I, I knight you. And when she does that, she, has not, not, she doesn't do that just in her normal everyday, well, hers are never normal every day, but in, in her high-class outfit. She usually has some kind of a, a robe, mantle around her, and most often, when I've seen him, she has one of the thousands of crowns, but she has a crown on her head. It would be very inappropriate for you to show up with a crown on your head. 
Okay? I, have you got the picture? So when I'm going to put the best robe on you, I have honored you. If you go to in the academic world today, and a professor or somebody, or even a, a well-known person that they're going to reward because of their, their contribution to society, you know, so uh, we're going to give an honorary doctorate. Okay? When they give the honorary doctorate, they don't just give you a piece of paper. They come and they put a robe on you. So if, 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 you, if you live in that world, you know what the robes are. You know, you know what a bachelor's robe looks like. You know what a master of divinity. And then they have these stoles. Have you ever seen graduation have stoles? I was at an ordination ceremony one time, and, and uh, they all decided, all the clergy decided they're all going to wear uh, their, their, not just their preaching stole, but, but the, the, the thing from their seminary. And I didn't have one. It's like because I'm just not into that kind of stuff. And so my good friend, who was like my bishop, uh, says to me, I told him, well, I don't have one. I'll just wear my preaching robe. He says, no, no, I'll, I'll let you have one of mine. So we're all uh, getting out there, and, and uh, I, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know my colors. I don't, oh, you know, that's plaid. That must mean you're from this Scottish clan. I don't, I don't know those things. You know, you've you got a different stole. Yours is red and pink, and mine is, you know, you ever look at I mean, it's like, what a man, very colorful things. So I'm putting on, on mine. And, and I was mingling with about 20 pastors there and getting ready for the service. And one of the pastors comes over and says, Don, I didn't know you went to Yale. <laughs> and I said, I didn't either. <laughs> I, I, my, my bishop went to Yale, so the one he gave me was, was the colors of Yale. I didn't know that. And it was very interesting. Because when we walked out for the ceremony, I stood a little taller. I, you know, I, I, this is serious, and there's a message in this. <laughs> I did. You know, in that academic world, where I went to school, Gordon Conwell was not like, you, you know, it didn't have, in, in our world it had a lot of prestige, but in the world of liberalism, that's one of those evangelical Bibles things, you know. Uh, but I'm walking out, I'm from Yale. No, not from Yale, but I'm wearing Yale. <laughs> And, and I did. I, I can still remember that, walking a little bit taller. You know, it, 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 yeah, a little swagger, you know. Why? Because my bishop honored me. And he made me a Yale graduate. Now, now listen, you can get an honorary doctorate from Yale and you never took one class there. Pastor Long, we've looked at what you've done. We've seen, that you're, you know, the, these great things. And we want to acknowledge you uh, in front of our students as a, as a man who's done great things for the cause of God, and so we're going to give you an honorary doctorate. You know, if I have an honorary doctorate, I could put out there Donald Long, Ph.D., and you could refer to me as Dr. Long. In the academic world, you can. What did you do to do it? I didn't take one course. Okay? But I have an And by the way, that's fair. That is right. Because there's people who never went to college who've done more for humanity than people who did go to college. How do we acknowledge that the college degree isn't, isn't it, okay? And so putting on a robe in culture is a sign of honoring. The better the robe, the better the honor. You're with me? When you come to, back to Father's house, he's waiting, he's waiting to treat you with the best robe. He's not waiting there to say, you scoundrel, wasted all that money, went off and lived in sin, did things you knew you shouldn't have done, said things you know you shouldn't have said. What a despicable life. No. You know when Yeshua on the cross said to, the, the one guy says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he says, today you will be with me in paradise. I would like to have seen that. Because reading this, that man died on a cross and woke up in paradise and an angel came over and said, Son, here's a brand new robe for you. <laughs> and he looks and he's looking at all the others and it's like, I'm not less than. I'm not a thief. 
I, I'm standing here, and as far as everybody surrounding him, he's on equal status with all of them because we're all wearing white robes. We're all wearing white robes. All of us. I'll look at Paul and say, I'll go over to Scott and say, do you notice our robes are the same? Have, have, have you noticed that Paul says white ours? He doesn't get a brighter robe. There are difference in crowns, but not in robe. And you need to understand that. Because a crown is the result of the work you've done, but a, re a robe is honor given to you by your father, and he puts the best, he's waiting to put the best on you. Oh, glory to God. I, I, I got two more to go, and I'm already happy. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, the best robe. Best robe makes, makes me want to get out of any pigsty and run home. Come on. Are, are, are you with me? And, and then he puts on... <laughs> okay, he puts a ring on. What is the ring? I mean, come on. What, what you got? He's, he, servant, go get a robe, put it on. And the servants are like, wow. His father is going to honor him. The very moment he comes back, he, he hasn't even finished his speech about how bad he was. And he's already putting on a robe of honor. And then he says to another angel, go get one of our family rings. It's not just a ring. It's not just, uh, look, would you go down to, to the, the dollar store and see if you can find a cheap ring and put it on them? Uh, you know, we, we've got a vault somewhere and we've got, you know, a whole bunch of rings that we got at a flea market one time. Pick one of them out for them. So I don't want them to have naked fingers. I want them to have a ring. That's not what it is at, at all. It is a family ring. And the family ring communicated one thing. The total power and authority of the family. When you, the ring in those days was a sealing ring. It had the family crest on it. If you were going to sign a document, you didn't have to go, okay, I sign it. I'm going to take money from this, I'm going to do this, I'm in the middle of a transaction, and we need a signature. You didn't sign in those days. You took your ring and you stamped it. You stamped it. And my ring didn't say, Don Long. My ring says, the Long family. The whole family, authority and power. My dad, my granddad, everything that, that my name means is in that. I'm not sealing it in me the prince or me the scoundrel's son. That if I have the family ring, I have all power and authority. Glory to God. That when I use the family ring, come on, when I seal it, it is settled forever. What I do with that ring carries all the authority. I could be walking in a place and somebody, you know, people don't know me. They don't know who I am and I've just come into a new town and I'm dealing with merchants and I'm looking around and there's a merchant there and he's got wares and I come into his store. And, and while I'm chatting with him, you know, he, he notices I have a ring. And being a good merchant, you know, without making it obviously, he looks at the ring. And the minute he looks at the ring, oh, wow, uh, can I get you some tea, sir? Uh, anything that I can make your stay in my store comfortable? Come on, come on. He saw that I am carrying the authority, the power, the financial resources of that family. I didn't have to say, do you know who I am? I don't need any ego. I don't have an ego. I'm part of a family. It's not about me. It's about the family. Come on. Are, are you under, see, there's no place. To, you know, when people are trying to prove they have something, they don't know who they are. Because when you know who you are, you don't need to prove it. 
You don't need to prove it to anybody when you know who you are. You just walk with that authority. Come on. And when you have the... Fa- I mean, this is an amazing story of restoration because, again, we're, we're, not, even, we're not even 10 hours into the day. We're, 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 we, the sun has just shown up. And, and, and hasn't even gotten through his speech. And the Father has ordered a new robe. I'm going to, put, I'm going to give you honor. And now I'm going to give you all the power and authority. How, how great is that power and authority? Look, look at this. Turn with me to Genesis. Genesis 41. You, you, are you still with me? Genesis 41. Oh, man. This, I, I saw this and I said, I said, Lord, you know, show me where that power and authority shows up at in the Bible. Genesis 41, verse 41. 41, 41. You know the story. Joseph's in prison. Boy, talk about a change. It, this is as dramatic as the prodigal son. Prodigal son's in a pigsty. Come on. He's in a pigsty one day. 24 hours later, he's got a robe of honor, the family ring, And we're going to find out what else he has in a minute. In less than a day, Joseph is in a prison, falsely accused. Come on. We got two different... One guy's in a bad place because he he got a bad rap. The other's in a bad place because he made it himself bad. But they're both in a hopeless situation. And Joseph has one thing as as a child of the living God is that he can interpret dreams. And you know the story. Pharaoh has the dreams. Nobody can tell him what's happening. Uh, Joseph is remembered by the, 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 the king's servant. They dress Joseph up. You know, again, you can't come in smelling like that. Clean him all up and bring him into the king, and he interprets the dream. Look what happens. Verse 41, so Pharaoh said to Joseph, I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Uh, excuse me. Can you imagine the jailer who brought Joseph up? I'm the jailer, and I'm bringing the prisoner up. And, and, and I'm a nobody in the kingdom. I'm just the jailer. I don't have status. I've never even been in the king's presence, Pharaoh's presence. Never been in his presence. And now because of this fortune teller, I've got to go able to do this. But he doesn't have right thinking or anything. So he's probably trembling just being in the presence of the king Uh, the Pharaoh, and hoping that Joseph doesn't mess things up and they both lose their heads. So he's shaking in his boots. And and, and this prisoner's here. And you can imagine all the magicians there. A prisoner. Joseph. The man who is in prison. Imagine all the the powers that be around Pharaoh. You know, the, the heads of this department and that department looking down at this. Jewish slave who has the ability to speak for God. And Pharaoh says something that absolutely shocks them to the roots. I hereby, this is an official declaration. He's not just passing the time. I, he's saying it so everybody can hear it. I hereby put you in charge of the whole land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his finger and put it on Joseph's finger. Come on, come on, come on, come on. He dressed him in robes of fine linen and put a gold chain around his neck. Pharaoh took his ring, his signet. He didn't say, go find one of the family rings. He took his signet ring, Pharaoh, and put it on the finger of Joseph. The way I read that in there, he personally did this. Come here, son. Come here, son. Here, give me your finger. I'm sure there were audible gasps. There had to be. None of them would have ever imagined putting Pharaoh's ring on. If if they were cleaning Pharaoh's uh, uh, bed chambers one day and his ring was there, I don't think they would have even had the nerve, let's try it on. And, I mean, they could have had their heads, boom. And Pharaoh takes it and he doesn't give it to the servant and say, put it on. He puts it 
on Joseph's finger. He says, I make you in charge of all. Mm, 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 mm. Dresses him in robes. Come on, come on. Listen, verse 43. He had him ride in a chariot as his second in command. In verse 44, he said, I am Pharaoh, but without your word, no one, <laughs> no one will lift a hand or foot in all of Egypt without your word. God comes and says, I'm going to put honor on you. I'm going to give you the family ring. And son, daughter, nothing will happen unless you say so. If you say, be healed, it'll happen. But if you don't say it, it won't. Because you have the authority now. If you say, whatever I put my hand to prospers, you will prosper because you said it. But if you say it isn't working, it isn't working because you have the authority. It's not what I, your father, want. It's the authority I gave you. You have the, I am still God, but you have the authority to act for me in this world. Come on, come on. Are, are, are you beginning to see that this just wasn't come home, pat you on the back, forgive you, and you too can be forgiven? That's a good message. You too can be forgiven. I don't care how bad the pigsty was, you can be forgiven. It's, forgiveness is so small compared to what's going on here. I'm restoring you into the family at a position of all the authority that even Yeshua, my son, has. And I'm going to symbolize it by giving you honor, position. And I'm going to give you the family symbol of authority. Are you still with me? The last thing, then, is he said, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Well, the kid needs shoes. Certainly, if he has, if he has a ring and a robe, we, you know, let's get him a new pair of shoes, too. When I told you about the guy that bought me the suit, I, he, that's what he told me. He was gonna, but he got me two pairs of shoes as well. It's like, whoa, that was, you know, rather humbling. What are sandals? What are sandals in the kingdom of God? Remember, this is a parable. Come on, this is a parable. Yeshua is trying to create a picture. We all got the picture. The son returns. We see him talking with his dad. We see the dad saying, go get a robe. You go get the ring. You go get, those, get some new sandals. We, we got the picture in our mind, but it's a parable of the kingdom. He's not to come out and say, we heard a great story today about a prodigal son, a lost son. No, no, no. He's trying to tell you how the kingdom works and where you fit in the kingdom of God. Oh, where you fit in the kingdom of God. Best robe, honor, ring, power and authority. Sandals are your reputation in society. Come on, it's your reputation in society. That's what the symbol is in the Bible. The sandals are your reputation in society. Glory to God. Ephesians 6.15 says, Having shod your feet in preparation to face the enemy with firm-footed stability, the promptness and the readiness produced by the good news of the gospel of peace. That our feet are to be shod with the preparation of the gospel. That I'm not walking in there, you know, my shoes are falling off. Come on. But my feet are shod with that which makes me ready to quickly attack the enemy. Here comes the SWAT team. You're there because you're watching and it's like, there's some bad guys holed up in a building. The SWAT team shows up. They got their shield. They got everything like that. And you look over at one of the guys, and he has open-toed sandals. Somehow the whole image, you know, of the guy with his, his rifle and his helmet and everything, and he's got open-toed sandals. No. He shows up with combat boots, steel-toed boots. You know, and what might he do with those boots? Kick open the door. <laughs> Come on. Come on. Shoes are vital. It has 
to do with your reputation in society. Not that you have a reputation of a very nice, gentle guy. You have the reputation of somebody who will get things done. Somebody who not only has the power in the ring, but knows how to exercise it. I don't have it here. I wear it on my feet. I walk in it. I walk in it. I walk in a store like I own it. I walk in this world as if I'm in charge of the world, it's not in charge of me. That, that I, I learn, therefore, to, to walk with people. With all due respect, you may be the boss, and I respect you, but I walk with authority that I carry. And it's not the authority to prove you wrong, to override you. I have a, an authority to change things in this dimension. I was, I was down paying our, our water bill this week, and I, uh, while I'm standing there paying it, the, the door in the office uh, city hall opened up, and, and the mayor walked out, Mayor Di Natale. You know, and he looked over and saw me right away. You know, comes over. Pastor, how are you? And I stuck my hand out, and I grabbed it from my other hand. I said, is all well with you? I thought, where did that come from? But I've been asking God, help me walk with authority. I'm, 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 I'm your representative. And, and I'll respect the mayor because he's the mayor, but is, is all well with you? Because if he had said, well, I've got some issues... I would have said, I got his hand. Let's pray about it right now. You, you understand what I'm saying? You, you, you got to walk with that. And he said, I, I don't want my son to have a new robe, a new ring, but you know, he's, he's stumbling in the dirt and stubbing his toe and everything. Go get new sandals. Romans chapter 12, 15 says, How can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Glory to God. 2 Corinthians 5.20 We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Are you getting a different picture of what's going? Come on. Abba's looking for us to say, I've been, I've been off here in religion. I've been doing good things and, 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 or I've been messed up and doing bad things. But I want to get into the family, the heart of the family, the core of the family. Come on. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Yahweh my Father. Yeshua, my elder brother, my Savior. Though Abba is also Savior according to the Old Testament. And Holy Spirit. Man, this is a family affair. This is a family affair. And you and I have been invited to be part of the family. Not take a seat way off there somewhere. Not go in another room somewhere. Not being a distant relative. But you and I are called to... Realize that when we come to Abba, he's standing there with a new robe uh, for you. And it's going to be a best robe so he can honor you. He's got a ring of power and authority for you. And he's got sandals. He's got your reputation. He wants to shod you with sureness and confidence so you walk as the son or daughter you are. Not hoping and wishing and maybe, but you stand tall, act tall, live tall, because you know who you are. Glory to God. So, let me bring it to a conclusion by asking one question. So are you qualified? Are you qualified? Boy, I'd like that position. I'd like to have the honor. I'd like to have the ring. Uh, I, I'd, I'd like to ha have all that. You know, back in, in Daniel chapter 1 uh, is, is a story of, of the young men from Israel that had been carried off into captivity and Nebuchadnezzar. Let me read this to you. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king uh, ordered the chief of his court officials to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. And then he said, you need to teach them the language and the literature of the Babylonians and assign them the food, and you know the rest of that story. But notice what he says. Go find me young men without any physical defect. Well, if you had a physical defect, you're not qualified. Okay? I, I, want, I want you to find young men who uh, are handsome. So, uglies are now. That's not, that's not politically correct, but I guess they don't get in. Uh, 
who, who show an aptitude for every kind of learning. So let's give them some IQ tests. Let's, you know, okay, you don't qualify. There might be a lot of people who want to be, be you know, a Green Berets. They go and they flunk out. Why? They don't qualify. They don't, don't meet the requirements. Uh, Well-informed. We're going to test their knowledge and they don't seem to know much so they don't qualify. Quick to understand. Qualified to serve. Qualified to serve. Qualified to serve. When you look at Gideon, what, what does God say to him? Tell those who, who, who don't want to fight. Tell them to go home. Two-thirds of the army leave. You know why? They weren't qualified. If you don't want to fight, you're not qualified to be in the army. Go home. And then of those who said, we're all willing to fight, he said, now test them. And you know, they go and sip the water and they, some do it right and some do it wrong. Those who do it wrong, you don't qualify. Go home. So out of that vast army, Gideon's left with 300 men that qualify out of 30,000. Wow. Glory to God. So the question is, do you qualify? Now when I look at that, I'm not sure. If, if I look at Nebuchadnezzar, I, am I handsome? Am I, you know, I, I don't know that I qualify. If I look at Gideon's uh, thing, you know, do I, do I really think I'm going to be, you know, the, the 1%? Hmm? Uh, you know, it's amazing. 80% of Americans think they're above average. Some of you will get that later. Check your math out. 80% cannot be all above average. You know, some of you who think you're above average are really average. And, uh, and, and so, the, you know, uh, do I qualify? And I grew up in a church that put in front of me, I most likely don't. I most likely don't. I've got a devil that, that runs with a little list that says, here's how, how come you don't qualify. You're angry at that person, you're mean to this person, you don't talk to that person, you did this, you said that, you didn't do this, you didn't say this, yeah, blah, 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 blah. What is it? He's trying to present in front of you a, a list of why you don't qualify. And then we go into churches where we're led to believe we don't qualify. Now there's a difference between being corrected and told you don't qualify. You need correction, but that's because we want to get you somewhere. But what qualifies you to be in the family? Mm, glory to God. Are you qualified? Are you qualified? Wow, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. And the things you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who are also qualified to teach others. So, in other words, I have to find people who are qualified. That's, that's, a, that's a good measure of qualification. But when we come to the, the robe and the ring, are you qualified? What qualified him for that? What qualified him to get the robe? What qualified him to get the ring? What, what, was, was he tested? We're going to test you to see if, in fact, you can be a faithful son? No! The, qualif the qualification was, you are my son. That's the qualification. That's the qualification. And so, there's great news in the kingdom. Let me give you two points and we'll wrap this up. The great news in the kingdom, number one, is that when you come into the kingdom, you are qualified. Colossians 1, 12 through 13, you might want to look at it. Colossians 1, 12 to 13, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints. For he rescued you from the dominion of darkness and brought you into the kingdom of the Son he loves. God has already qualified you to be in the family. Don't let the devil disqualify you. If you're in a pigsty, come home. Come home. Come home. Come home. The day you surrender your life to the Lord, he qualifies you for all the benefits in the family. You have as much right to everything as Yeshua has. You're a co-inheritor with him. Anything Yeshua can do, you and I can do. Anything Yeshua can have, you and I can have. And the church has taught us just the opposite. We are nothing. We have nothing. And they've said anything we get is in heaven when we go there. But the kingdom of heaven is here and now. When you come into that kingdom, God qualifies you. I'm not looking for someone to qualify me. 
Who qualified me to be a pastor? I mean, I, I, I had an ordination certificate on my wall, but we were singing that song there, and God reminded me what he told me last week, and I didn't do it, which is to get rid of my crown, so I had to leave the worship and go in there and take off my, from my wall my crowns. I'm not qualified to be a pastor because the United Church of Christ ordained me. I'm not qualified because Gordon Conwell graduated me, and they won't graduate men or women if they don't think they're qualified to be pastors. I'm not qualified because the First Congregational Church of Essex called me to be a pastor and requested that ordination. I'm not qualified because church and another church and another ministry asked, would you come be our pastor? That doesn't qualify me. I'm qualified because God qualified me. God qualified me. What qualifies you to be able to speak to something and it changes? Who do you think you are? I don't think who I am. God qualified you to speak the word. God qualified you to speak his word to people. God qualified you to bind and to cast out. God's already qualified you. Number two, when you come into the kingdom, you're marked with a seal. Ephesians 1.13, having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. In the realm of the Spirit, Every demonic spirit knows who you are. Because not only did God qualify you, He put something on you. He marked you with His Holy Spirit. Come on. The Amplified says you were stamped with a seal. Now we know that in the negative, what's going to happen in the end times? People are going to take the what? Mark of the peace without which no man can buy or sell. And I'm not going to get off on what people might think the mark of the beast is, but you're going to be marked with the beast. Well, I got news for the kingdom of darkness. I am marked with the seal of the Holy Spirit. Glory to God. And I might not know it, the Christian might not know it, but when you walk into a place of darkness, darkness knows you're marked, and darkness does everything to hope you don't know it. Darkness knows you're a daughter of God, and darkness spends every effort it can to keep you from knowing it. Darkness is waging a war against you understanding who you are, because then you're defeated. Once you find out who you are and whose you are, Glory to God. Listen, when you are in the workplace, many of you have a badge. Anybody have a badge you wear? I wore a badge for, for you know, digital and HP and compact. You know, you got to have a badge. If, if you're in the military, you have a rank. You not only have a name badge, but you have a rank. I don't have to go in there and find out who the senior officer is. Uh, excuse me, which one of you guys is senior? You know, I'll be laughed right out. One of the first things I'm going to learn is to recognize rank. Okay? Oh, I see two bars, you're a captain. Okay? I, I, I see a, the little eagle on there, you know, you're a colonel. I see a star, you're a brigadier general. I see, you know, and as the rank goes up, my uh, attention goes up. Come on. If you're in a team, it's your uniform, your color. Hmm? How do you know which team is playing? You, you know, it's like, can you imagine, we're going to play football and wear whatever you want, guys. We're going to have a sports contest. And, you know, the quarterback goes back to pass, but he can't, he can't figure out. Well, wait a minute. There's a blur of colors here. You know? You know, it's like, oh, they got mixed up. We're all wearing red, so I don't know which red's my red. That doesn't work. No, no, no. See, there's got to be something that, that marks you. When we go to Israel, just in, in, and we don't, no, it's yellow day. doesn't mean you have to look like, you know, Big Bird. You know, you, you, you have a skirt on or pants on that are a different color, but you happen to have a yellow shirt, or sometimes you don't have a yellow shirt, so you wear a shirt with a little yellow uh, uh, scarf or something on it. But what sticks out to the people around? You, they didn't see you come and say, oh, you're wearing, wearing yellow. 
didn't even make an impression on them. They see 20 people coming with all yellow. Uh, are you a family or something? That's what I always ask. Are you a family or something? Huh? Come on. And, and we've immediately identified ourselves. Huh? Old Testament followers, they had a mark that they wore. Zitzitz. Zitzitz. So I'm walking, as that story I told you, I'm walking down there in, in, in Houston around the business place at Compact, and, and, and this guy comes up and says, Bashana Tova, and I said, you know, I said, and for you as well, and my manager stand there says, well, why did he do that? And the other guy says, he's a member of the tribe. He saw my tzitzit. He didn't have him, <laughs> but he saw my tzitzit. He obviously was Jewish. So he knew, you know, Lashana Tova. Let's give the, the greetings for the holiday. And when he said, I'm a member of the tribe, it's like, <laughs> yes. I'm a member of the tribe. Why? I have something that, that you know, son, you know, aren't, aren't you, aren't you that, that guy's son that went off and we were heard about you. You were up living a wild, right? What? Wow, I almost didn't recognize you. you. Wow, that robe. I mean, whoa, look at, look at, look at the, you, you got the, you know, and, and they're starting, they're confused. I, I'd heard he was serving pigs up somewhere. And then he walks, dressed in the finest robe. He's got the family authority and power here. Huh? You might have been saying negative things about that boy. But when he walks in with that robe, those feet shod, that ring on his finger, He's now, you're looking at him and you're not going to say, you're the scoundrel. You're not calling him a scoundrel. You're going to have the whole family down your neck. He's coming in as a member of the family. You know, I, I, I would like to be able to give a family ring. Andrew, could you come up here for, for a minute? Would you start passing these out to every adult? One per adult. I, you know, when I was doing this, I, I thought, boy, you know what I'd really like to end this sermon with is give you all a family ring. Wouldn't that be great? But, you know, I looked at little cheap places and somehow plastic rings don't seem to convey. You know, I want to, I want, you know, what do you, you're not going to go to work tomorrow and wear a plastic ring, you know, and, and, and everything. And I thought, but you're part of this family. You're part of this family. Okay. You're, you're, you're part of this family. And, and I thought, well, what represents this family? Well, we are a Christian church with a Jewish heart. We're coming up to celebrate uh, Stand with Israel in about three weeks from now. And, and I thought, a star of David, that's who we are. A star of David, that's who we are. Could you get that for me? Thank you. <laughs> that's that's right, Colonel. Uh, okay. Is that pretty? Isn't that nice? I'm going to have to get some more so the children. I'm not leaving you out, children, but but they could only send me thirty. So um, I'll get, make sure all the adults have one, and then uh, then we'll get some for the children. Is that cool? Is that is that nice? Cut! Come on. You, you, you have the authority of the family. You, you can walk out with that. And, and uh, somebody said, what, what's that? Oh, it's part of the family I'm in. You, you're representing Israel. You're representing God's people. You know, there, there's our family over there somewhere else at the First Baptist Church, and they have a different mission as, as their family. Their family is part of Christ's family, has a peculiar mission. Our family is part of Christ's family as a peculiar mission. Come on. And, and you're in the family, so you have a family identifier. And you can wear that wherever you go, and, and for sure, you know what? It's going to get attention. If you wear it, it'll get attention. People want to know what it is. And you say, oh, it's, it's the family I'm of. It's a family I'm of. I'm a part of something bigger. I have the ring of the king. I have the ring of the king. I have the identifier of our, our family. I am fully a part of it. I have all the authority of the family. A best robe is waiting for you. A ring, all the power and authority in Christ has been given to you already. The ring is yours to wear. The best robe is yours to put on. The sandals are your reputation in society of standing strong and being bold. 
And every day, you and I, and I put me in that, every morning I get up, I have a choice to make. I have a choice to make of what I put on. I do, I have that choice. Some days if I don't have anything on an, an agenda, I, I think, you know, I'm just going to lounge around. And then somebody comes at the door, and there I am in my pajamas, you know. It's like, ah, uh, you know, come on. But I have a choice of what I put on. It's always my choice. It's always my choice. And Abba has provided you the most excellent of garments to wear in this world. To get up in the morning to say, I'm going to put on the robe of righteousness. I'm going to put on the robe of my right standing. And I'm going to say, Abba, today, may I wear this robe in a way to honor you. May I wear my righteousness so I live in the world standing tall because I'm going to walk with integrity. I'm going to keep my mind pure. I'm going to honor you because you've honored me with righteousness as a robe. And I'm going to put on consciously the ring of the family, which is the power and authority that I command the day, the day doesn't command me. How's your day going? It's going excellent because I don't let the day decide that for me. I decide what the day's going to be. But if you don't put that ring on, oh, I'm, I'm not sure. And I'm going to put on shoes. I have shoes I wear for different things. You know, I got lounge shoes that I lounge in. I got shoes that I work in. And they got paint on them and everything else. And then I got shoes that, that I try to keep, you know, for Sabbath. These are, these are new Sabbath boots I got. Trying them out. Pastor Shad has boots, so I thought I could wear boots. You know. He, he's from West Virginia, and I'm from the Western Wall. <laughs> but see, I make a choice. I make a choice. And when... When I look over my life, I just realize I have failed to make that choice far too many times. Far too many times. Far too many times I'm in my day, I'm running through the day and realize, what happened to my robe of righteousness? Come home at night and realize I never put it on in the morning and therefore, guess what? I didn't live a very righteous life. Come on. I have days when... When, when I should have taken authority over thoughts that were in my mind or situations that came up, I should have right then and there acted with authority, but I didn't. Why? Because I didn't consciously in the morning say, I'm putting on the ring of authority. So that when I run into unexpected situations, they don't overwhelm me, I overwhelm them. So that when somebody has a drastic need, I'm not there saying, oh, bless them God, do something for them. I step in and take authority over it. Why didn't I? Because I didn't put my ring of authority on that morning. Or when I go when I should be bold and I've been timid. Why? Because I didn't put on the, the sandals, the, the new sandals that represent sure-footed stability in that which I know. I didn't consciously do that. Oh, I know that. Do I believe it? Yes. If I'd been in church and a sermon was preached about it, I'd say, yes, 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 yes. But every single day, you and I need to make a choice of what we're going to wear before we go out that door. And once you're in the day and the day starts falling apart or things aren't going right, then you stop and think, ah. I think maybe I need to put a sign on the mirror in the morning that says, did you dress properly? Come on. And, and, and I'd like to tell you, well, you know, I... I've been doing things all their life. I've been a Christian since 16. It's second nature. No, it's not second nature. Natural nature is degenerative. Natural nature starts falling apart. If you don't consciously every day make a decision that my father took me out of the pigsty of life, and when I repented at the age of 16 and I came into his family, he had there a new robe, a ring of authority, and the sandals to carry me sure-footed. And they are still mine. And they are still yours. And if the devil has stolen them from you, it's time for you to take back that which the enemy has stolen. Take it back. Take it back. And say, I have a right to the robe of righteousness. I have a right to the authority of being in the family of God. I have a right to be confident in my faith all day long. I have a right to those things. There's got to be a righteous anger in you about what's been stolen. 
And you go do the war against the enemy and the Bible tells you that if you'll take the word of God and you'll pronounce it and you'll speak it, he will flee from you. It's the same battle of Yeshua in the wilderness. You know, Yeshua said, it is written. How do you answer the devil? It is written. Well, you know you don't. It is written. Well, you know you're not going to get ahead. It is written. And the stronger you get on saying it is written, suddenly begin to say, you know, it is written, devil. It is written that I've been made the righteousness of God in Christ. Stop bringing up that my past. Stop bringing up all the things. If I've still done them, I'm going to be before the Father and read. But don't you be talking about things way back there. Don't talk about what I was. That's not who I am today. I decree, I declare. And when you say, well, who do you think you are? You've prayed and haven't got answers. You've been believing for years and haven't seen that happen. You've been confessing that and it isn't. You know, he's like a spoiled brat. You've been saying that over and over and over and over again. None of your business. It's between me and my Heavenly Father. What I have to learn, my Heavenly Father will show me. What is standing in the way, my Heavenly Father will show me. It's none of your business. And you certainly are never going to tell me the truth when it comes to why am I here when I should be there. I'm going to fight back with the Word of God. I'm going to use the power and authority. And when it comes to having those feet shod with sureness and stability, when I'm unsure, I'm going to say, He's made me confident. I'm going to find the verses and say them, whether I feel. Let the weak say, I am strong. Let the sick say, I am healed. Come on. I know I've, I've got the weapon. It is the sword. It is the Word of God. And by using that, you're going to get back all the territory the enemy stole. It's yours. It's your honor. It's your robe. It's your ring. It's your shoes. It's yours. He can't give it to anybody. He won't give it to anyone else. It's yours. And if it's hanging in a closet somewhere because the devil stole it, get it back. Get it back. Get it back. Did you get anything out of this today? Glory to God. Hallelujah. I'm excited. <laughs> Father, we thank you and praise you for uh, the parables that Yeshua put in front of us so we can begin to understand who we are, not by looking at who we are, but looking at a story of a young man who came back and the amazing, overwhelming compassion and graciousness and honor that you gave him. And then do that translation and say, Father, that's what you right now want to do for each of us. Oh, thank you, Abba. You're waiting to give honor. You're waiting to give authority. You're waiting to give sure-footed stability. You're just eager and compassionate and filled with an eagerness to, to give us everything we need, be it healing, be it finances, be it, the, be it the joy of the Lord. We spend our whole life being dull and gloomy and joyless. That's over, Abba. Joy is an inheritant right of ours. and We will receive it. And we will fight back, and we will reclaim lost territory. And all of God's people in agreement said, Amen. Let's worship the Lord with his tithes and our offerings. Remember that God loves a what? Cheerful, hilarious, prompt giver. Stand to your feet and we'll go over our confession right away. Father, according to your word and by faith, I honor you with my wealth and know that my barns are filled to overflowing. I have too much to store it all. I bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. I see you throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that I do not have room enough for it. Because I am a tither, According to Malachi 3.11, you will rebuke the devourer for me. That which comes to devour my health, devour my wealth, devour my soul, you, Abba, will rebuke for my sake. According to your word, I have been made rich in every way so that I can be generous on every occasion. I give 
and I know it is given to me, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, is being poured into my lap. I sow generously, so I know I am reaping generously. I know that you are giving me more than I need, so that I always have all I need, and more than enough for every good cause. I am a tither, and I am a cheerful giver in the name of Yeshua. Glory. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Did you get anything out of that today? Huh? Was that, does that open that parable up? I encourage you, you know, go home this afternoon, tomorrow, Sunday, sometime. Just sit down, open, open to Luke 15, and read it. Read it. You can get the CD and listen to the message again, but just start reading it and, and allow the Holy Spirit to take things out of that and apply it to you. You, you might need the ring. You're okay with the robe, but you don't have the ring. Maybe, maybe you got the ring, but, but you've got to work on the sandal part. You know, just, just meditate on that and, and let Holy Spirit open it up for you. Father, we thank you and praise you that we can plant in good ground. We know the harvest coming is well-pleasing to you. We salt our offerings according to your word to remind us that all that we bring into the kingdom, Yahweh, is secure and held confidently by your great mighty power in Yeshua's name. And God's people said, Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Holy One of Israel so fill your life to overflowing that you walk in the confidence of who you are, that you stand taller than you've ever stood, that you speak stronger than you've ever spoken, that you see more clearly than you've ever seen before, that you are the ambassador for Christ you've called to be, that this week might be a week of exceeding abundance and faithfulness in your life, in the name of Yeshua our Lord, and all of God's people together said, Amen, amen and Amen. Glory to God.